Hi, welcome to BFI Flare 2021. Um, I'm Tara Brown, one of the programmers, and I'm really excited um, to have this extended um, post-film discussion about the excellent documentary, Well-Rounded. Um, I have um, people from the film and also some excellent sort of fact activists and curators from Britain, and we're going to have a good old chat. Um, so I'm just going to ask everyone to sort of just say the name, you know, really, you know, simple introductions and their pronouns. So um, my name is Tara Brown and I use they, them pronouns. I'll go. I'm Shanna Miera. I'm the director of the film. I use she, her pronouns. Thank you. I'm Candy Palmiter and I'm she, her. I'm Lydia Okello and my pronouns are they, them. Okay, I'll get it. It's my name is Charlotte <laughs> Cooper. Uh, I use she, her, and um, yeah, I'm a, a author of a book called Fat Activism and uh, involved in therapy with fat people. And I'm so delighted to be here to talk about this amazing film. Uh, my name is Grace Barber Plenty. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm a film programmer based in London. Um, and I program work focused on diverse identities, so specifically films by and about black people and also looking at fatness and body positivity. Um, and I also run an Instagram page called Fat in Film, which is my baby that's focused on positive depictions of fat people in film and TV. Awesome. You know you're going to have about to have a good time. So um, let's start off with the excellent that is Well Rounded. Um, I just found out that Candy and Lydia actually hadn't met each other yet. So, um, you know, um, so I'm sure you watched the film. So how does it feel sort of watching each other on screen and sort of talking about their lives? How, how, does, that, how does that feel to you? Um, you know, I loved watching the film. It's, uh, I loved being part of it. Um, when Shanna got in touch with me, as soon as she said, this is the premise, I thought, oh yeah, I want to be on board. This is something I speak about all the time and I do it pretty isolated. I'm in Toronto, uh, Ontario, Canada. And so seeing the film, it was really lovely to see other people. Like I started following Lydia right away on Instagram, uh, which uh, your sense of style, my friend, mm, perfect. <laughs> so it's really nice to just meet like-minded people who are also trying to further this conversation. Definitely. And, then, and Lydia, how do you sort of feel watching the film? I just felt so lucky. Like I felt um, similarly when Shanna approached me, I was just so excited that somebody was making a project like this. It's exactly what I, um, as like a young person felt like I was missing. And so to be someone who gets to be a part of that as an adult is so, so exciting. And to like see other folks um, like Candy and, and our other castmates, uh, just living and being really rad and, and uh, showing that our experience is not a monolith by any means and that our experience is unique to each person. Um, I, was, I was really proud and really honored to be a part of the film. So I love watching it and I, I feel so lucky that I'm in it. Thank you. Um, and um, and Grace, like, yeah, did you get a chance to sort of watch it all and like, how did you feel about the film? Yeah, I thought the film was excellent. And what I found really refreshing was the way that these intersections were sort of analysed and acknowledged. And it wasn't sort of, I'm used to seeing a lot of um, media about fat people where sort of a person of colour or a queer person or a non-binary person is sort of thrown in uh, at the end for a bit of a mixture and diversity. And it just <laughs> felt like intersectionality really ran through this and there was the acknowledgement that so many of the participants um, experiences were different and that, and that was kind of really treated with respect it was like the differences were given their moments and also the you know the commonalities whether that's um, the bad things and fat phobia but also just kind of like the celebration and just kind of it really showed how awesome the participants all were so I really enjoyed it. Yeah and, um, and Charlotte um, how do you feel about the film? Well, I thought it was really beautifully made. And this theme about finding your people and not being alone seems very strong in this film. Of course, as a, you know, well, um, ex-scholar, I was really interested in um, Jenny Ellison's insights around uh, gender and obesity epidemic rhetoric. I thought they were fascinating. And also um, 
uh, Janet, uh, Tommy Yama's insights about uh, unpacking healthcare, why healthcare is such a nightmare um, for fat people. I thought they were really, um, yeah, bright and interesting and useful contributions. Um, but yeah, it's just a really beautiful piece of work. And, you know, the sense of finding your people, these are, these are people you want to be mates with, aren't they? The people on the screen. Yeah, they're all just really sort of people you kind of recognise and people you feel like, oh, you know, I could reach out to them. I think we actually understand each other. I think that's a really beautiful part of the film. Um, so Shana, you know, I'll come to you. Obviously, you sort of, you know, you started this whole process. You know, was intersectionality always sort of within your mind when making this film? Yeah, it definitely was because uh, I think I came to the understanding, uh, maybe not so crystalline, but I came to the understanding that the BMI was the foundations of the body mass index were racist. Mm. Um, and I just wanted to find people who maybe like me um, had cultural backgrounds uh, in Canada or North America that meant that being fat wasn't necessarily a terrible thing at home. Um, and I wanted to test that theory. Um, you know, for, for me at home, being fat was, was not a big deal, but I understood that outside in the Canadian context, it was a bad thing. So it's always felt part of my sort of cultural dissonance um, growing up in West Coast Canada as a, as a settler on these lands. So that's, that's what I brought to the, the kind of the premise. And then of course, I wanted to start off from the place of fat not being a bad thing. Um, I wanted to, to be distinctly different from other things that I've seen where, hell yay, the happy ending is that you all lost weight and you're happier. No, mm -hmm. I wanted it to just be radically different. And I wanted it selfishly to be the film that I wanted to see and the conversations that I wanted to have. And I think they naturally went in all these different directions. So they necessarily kind of ended up at health and healthcare um, and also power and control. And I think that came out through the academics, but it really powerfully came through everybody's individual stories as well. So I, I couldn't be more proud. Yeah, and like, I, for me, like, I do see that where fatness and queerness from race always comes together is sort of from a point of trying to reject shame. Um, and like, I always said to myself, like, I feel my most when I'm sort of shameless or so when I'm sort of shamelessly fat you know just eating all the time or just shamelessly just like looking larger than life glitter on my face because I'm just going down to get you know get some milk at the shop um I always find that sort of really important in life and I feel like that kind of came across in the film as well um, and like I think it's interesting that sort of everyone does have their sort of journey. So um, I'll just, I think I'll pivot to Grace and Charlotte. I guess um, was there like any particular places where you did feel seen in sort of watching that film? Well, I mean, it was absolute thrill to meet. I mean, I feel like we're friends, Candy, but it was a thrill to meet you on screen because we are the same age, and. Uh, so much of what you said uh, resonated with me and I'm really, what do I want to say, I'm really happy about this kind of outflowing of media around fatness that's happening at the moment um, but often it overlooks the slightly mature lady of the fuller figure and mm -hmm. um, you know it was great to hear you talking about menopause and to talk about life experiences and um, yeah so I really appreciated your presence plus you know my size offends you I mean on, really every line that came out of your your mouth was killer and uh, I really thought this is somebody I really have to make friends with and, and keep an eye on so yeah I mean it's just really beautiful I mean all of the contributors were um, were wonderful and of course you know sharing uh, scholarship with with Jenny I mean I feel seen there too but especially seeing you Candy that meant a lot to me to see to see you on screen talking about your life. I think um, for me the things that really stood out I mean similarly to Charlotte just like finding those points of connection with so many of the people in the film and just hearing about your real lived stories and sort of the openness um, with which you shared those but um, the thing that really struck me in the film was the phrasing as sort of coming out as fat which is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently myself um sort of always living within a fat body and sort of my size has modulated over the years but I've had a very you know like complicated relationship with my weight and it feels like um just 
it's kind of it's the internal and the external journey it's like the rise of the uh, body positivity movement and the ways in which that is now very mainstream and that's you know kind of being co-opted by like certain medias but then there's that going up against whatever personal struggles you have with your weight and kind of your acceptance and I feel that personally I made a decision one day that I was just gonna stop skirting around the fact that I was fat and I think just to hear it sort of contextualized and spoken about in the film and again sort of with no shame um was really beautiful and that really struck with me I should add, um, we actually, yeah. I did phrase some of the questions in the interviews as coming out as fat. And that was something that came to me through Lindy West, the writer. Um, she did a piece on This American Life where she talked about coming out as fat. And that really struck me as well because it's counterintuitive that you would come out as fat because we are visibly fat. We live our lives as fat people, <laughs> you know, sometimes in situations where we would rather not be seen as fat because we know we will face repercussions for it. Um, but yeah, she talked about that. And so I want to give, uh, want to give the credit to her for inspiring that line of thinking in the film. Yeah. Thank you. Tina. And then, um, and did you, and so, so you, you kind of crafted that on purpose. Was that sort of that you trying to connect again, that sort of, leaning into sort of losing that shame around fatness and do you think it was also kind of connecting that to queerness as well because you know coming out is obviously a very is a, I find it I find coming out be very non-linear but still something that kind of happens all the time even when you are just living as you are anyway did you was that sort of in your mind as well when you were sort of crafting these questions Mm -hmm. I think it was in my mind even when I was inviting participants to to be the face of the film because when you look at Lydia and you look at Candy they're very public people so they've had to come out as fat fat as part of their dialogue as fat people so Candy's a comedian and talks so eloquently about how fat is a big part of her comedy and her ethos but it's never um, a negative thing so she owns her body and demonstrates to us that there is another way of talking <laughs> about being a large person and it's a little bit mind-boggling because we see it so infrequently someone inhabiting their body in that way and leading with pride and same with Lydia online I think I mean I know so many people who since the film have started following Lydia <laughs> and we, Lydia we talk about you <laughs> because <laughs> you know <laughs> being able to scroll through Instagram and see images of Lydia in their awesome undies that I like saw the other day and and being and owning owning the discussion of their own body and owning the fact that being fat is part of their body and part of their modeling part of their non-binary identity I mean it's just huge so the 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 way that Lindy West phrased it as coming out was just so apt that it's now part of my thinking of it as well as someone who has been very private about talking about my own body all these years because I have understood that outside of my family talking about being fat is talking about a great failure of mine to everyone around me and so you know even with my closest friends this film has been my coming out in my own way um so um so yeah it's a really great term and it's, this is a queer film so you know yeah all, all around it works it, yeah it's fascinating though that in 2021 people still are stopped in their tracks when you make statements that are positive about your body. You know, I've, I've been interviewed on a couple of stores that have been going under in COVID times. There's stores that I, that I usually buy my clothes at. And the interviewer said, you know, I, how will I describe your size in the, and she was trying to tiptoe all around it. And I said, large and in charge, baby. And she was kind of like, oh, yes. oh, can I use that word exactly? I said, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm sorry if you're uncomfortable with my body. I am not. Me and her, we have this agreement. She shows up for me, this body. She shows up every time I want to get on stage, every time I want to get on a plane, every time I wanted to do something, she shows up. And so in return, she will never hear me talk or think negative things about her, nor will she hear me tolerate other people having negative thoughts or words about her. That's the agreement me and this body have. And uh, I, I just can't believe that in 2021, that still shocks people. Yeah, no, um, I remember really clearly, there was a song that came out awful, Big Girls, You Are Beautiful. And I remember I was sort of summer day with my friends and some very guy was like pointing me, Big Girl, You Are Beautiful. And I was like very calmly like, yes, I know. And he just stopped in his tracks. And still you he would have no me. chance, buddy, no chance. <laughs> <laughs> we were just kind of like yes I know my worth and it was just amazing that just knowing that alone 
seem to be the magic words to stop this very guy in the park. I, I like I, I, I kind of remember that from sort of time to time. Um, and when I was thinking about sort of like fatness and queerness, I always kind of, because I do think that fat and queerness are completely intertwined, but I always find it really hard to sort of talk about it. So I might go to Charlotte because you, you talk about it much better than I ever could. Um, and then I might also ask about after that sort of seeing how you feel like if you think how you think your fatness and queerness intersect because I feel that sometimes it kind of just adds another thing that just means that yes I'm just going to double down and just be even more out there and then sometimes because of you know um, sort of isms can get replicated from larger community into marginalized communities it can also make life pretty difficult so um so Charlotte I'm just gonna go to you first um because you've written really well about this you've spoken really well about this about sort of yeah how fatness and queerness are just completely interlinked like they're they are together yeah mm -hmm. yeah well you better watch out because I'm a postmodernist into queer theory you know all those brackets and you know uh obscure language that's totally my bag and uh I write about uh queer theory in my in my my latest book uh, and apply it to fat activism and the fat activism that interests me the most are the ones that are really weird and out there that kind of don't make sense but sort of make sense in a strange way that you can't quite uh, put your finger on that make you feel that there are other possibilities or that other worlds that there are other um, ways of being that, that that might be available to you so that's how what I love about um, well queer theory and and, and fatness and the, and the way that they, the sort of non-normativeness of it, the way that it's about the, the disruptiveness of it, that's what I, what I really, really love about um, fatness and queerness. And what can I say about my own fat queerness and my own coming out? I did theorize uh, coming out as fat in the, in the, in the 90s in a, in a previous, uh, get me, a previous book. And, uh, and I'm sort of interested in the ways that both fatness and queerness, yeah, disrupt ideas of what's right and proper and respectable and good uh, and appropriate. I love all that bad stuff. I think at heart I'm a bad girl and I love anything that's, that's kind of, yeah, that, that gets in the way, that's, you know, the thorn in the side. Uh, that's what fat and queer represents to me. Unfortunately, queer life at the moment can be extremely conservative and uh, I'm often treated as though, you know, I'm stupid, that I'm not quite as human as somebody who's who's more, more, more normative. So it does upset me that these qualities, these very special qualities of what, what queer means are not necessarily um, brought into community voices or community ideas around uh, difference and fatness. And of course, there are overlaps with disability there too. Um, but yeah, I think uh, queer and fat are life forces. Actually, I think I'd be I'd be nothing without them. Maybe not nothing without them, but you know, there'd be a it would be a bit more. My life would be a bit more beige without um, without queer fat sensibility, identity, uh, values. Um, they're really central to how I live my life and how I see things. Go on, Candy. I feel that I, I had a, a bit of a unique trail because I started my life as an athlete, very fit. Um, in great shape. And I also started my life with, with men. I spent 12 years with a man. And then at almost the same time, I got diagnosed with extreme uh, osteoarthritis. I lost my first hip. I now am on a wait list to get my second hip replaced. I started to gain weight and I met my wife of 20 years, who I've been with now for the last two decades. So I sort of got to walk for a while in, in these two worlds and then walk for a while in these two worlds. And what I thought was interesting, particularly from my parents' perspective, my parents had me in their 40s, so they were born in the 20s. They faced their own discrimination because my mother was white and my father was Mi'kmaq. She lost her, her, uh, her family for marrying him. But she found that she had to answer to people in my small town more about my weight than about my orientation. That, it, you know, after they got through the Oh, did, did Candy get married? Well, yeah, if you watch TV, you know that. I'm on, I'm on Canadian TV a lot. But then it was always that, now, is she sick? Like, why is she gaining so much weight? And, and again, looking at both of those things as though they are failures. And I loved what Dr. Charlotte said about how the queer community 
when I came into the queer community, I was very shocked at how very white and small and insular it was. And I went to my first women's dance and I'm a, I'm a gregarious person. So I was just walking up to groups and saying, hi, how you doing? And, and people were just like, oh, not interested. Listen, honey, I didn't say I want to go down on you. I said, hi, how you doing? What you say back is fine. Thank you. How are you? Yeah. Right. So it, it, it just really shocked me. I thought you're queer people. You should know what it is to be ostracized. So why are you putting up these little boundaries? Because I'm supposed to look like an Olympic soccer player. You know, it's yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, I'll just say really quickly, I don't have a tangible answer for the connection between queerness and fatness but I think it is definitely there and thinking about it I think the majority of my fat friends are also queer and it just feels like there's a kinship there and there's kind of there's this connection sort of on two levels and it's kind of like it's the shedding of the layers and we can talk about these things um and not only can we talk about like trivial things you know like clothes and all that important stuff and you know like dating and things like that we can talk about um, the things that kind of come between that and the you know how how we're able to be queer and fat at the same time and I think it really is is a beautiful thing and I think um, what's helped me sort of come into myself in both my queerness and my fatness has been those those connections and those friendships and some of those have kind of been formed from actively looking for them and some of these connections have just been in my life and they've sort of led me to become the person that I am I guess. Yeah. I just want to add a, a, a point, which is that the, um, the earliest people to theorize uh, fat and fat oppression were lesbians in, uh, on the West Coast in the early 70s. So there is a really long lineage of uh, thinking about, well, they wouldn't have called themselves queer at that point, but there's certainly a long uh, theoretical connection between otherness uh, around sexuality and gender and fatness and race that, that really stretches way back. I was thinking when I was listening to everyone talk, it's kind of like we have to work really hard at actually building those circles where you kind of go in thinking, oh, like it's a to general sort of LGBTQ um, community, and you kind of think to yourself, okay, I'm here now. And then you realize that you still got to keep building on yourself and keep building those connections and building that, those friendships when you realize that because I don't look like um, what's the name, Rapino, for, you know, the US soccer players, thick in blonde, um, aid, <laughs> that, you know, I'm going to have to sort of figure this out again um, myself. Um, and I want to sort of to pivot to sort of Lydia, because I, I was really excited seeing, like, you know, a dark-skinned uh, non-binary person who loves to dress up, like, you know, and uh, it was just really great to see that. So, um, I kind of wrote in my notes says I think it's really interesting you know with a uh, sort of a cis heteronormative society and the non-normative it's all this idea of sort of your weight sort of determining things around your gender sort of thing um so for example because I'm I'm femme um and I'm fat so it's so, so this like idea that if I sort of dress sort of so-called feminine or if I kind of got that hourglass if I sort of show my big boobs and it's okay but then to say that I'm non-binary I think people are like oh but you're not you know you're not wearing a grey t-shirt and um sort of really boring slacks and you know you have this gold bow in your hair you obviously can't be non-binary you know you're really fat and squidgy you know my experience of non-binary what I see on tv doesn't actually quite work you don't fit in here um so just really so so sorry that's sort of going around sort of talking about how I felt about that but I'm sure um that you know that you would have lots to add on to that yeah yeah definitely I feel like for me the um the intersection of kind of coming out as fat and coming out as queer were at a similar time in my life um of of kind of realizing that I was okay with the way that my body was, or at least I, I felt that I didn't need to change it. Um, and that definitely coincided with, with me realizing that I was a queer person. Um, and as far as like my non-binary identity, I think it's something that I still uh, am unpacking a very uh, like heteronormative or like cis uh, assumption of what non-binary looks like because for me 
I felt like that identity wasn't allowed. Even as I, as I found myself in queer community, I didn't, like you're saying, I didn't see myself as like, you know, a like flat chested person wearing all gray uh, and looking particularly um, more like masculine presenting all the time or like mask presenting. And so for me, it was, it was hard to face what I, the assumptions I was making about what that could mean and what non-binary could look like and, and whether or not I was allowed to identify with that. Um, and it took a really long time and, and it's still, I would say it's still a work in progress for me is feeling that my physical body, first of all, similarly, I, I think my physicality is something that people assume is womanly. Um, and, and similarly to what you're saying, people kind of, I've come up against people sort of, uh, not rejecting, but sort of opposing or like questioning my gender identity in a way that I feel like if I was thin and white and had no boobs, I don't think anybody would ask me twice. And I'm unpacking that and unraveling what that is and where that comes from, I think really for me has intersected with a lot of other um, things that uh, assumptions about myself and who I could be. Um, including like, you know, the, the interconnection of racism and the interconnection of like fat phobia, all of those things come under this umbrella of white patriarchy of the specifics of who gets to be what and whose identity is what and who decides that. Um, so I think for me, it's been really exciting and, and also uh, very emotional learning and unlearning how to accept who I am and, and the fact that I might wear lipstick today or I might wear lipstick every day or I might never wear lipstick again or I might wanna wear dresses every day or I might not. None of those things decide my non-binariness and that it's taken me a long time to get to that. And, I'm, and I feel really proud that I've got to that place but it's something that in our community I find extremely frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it really limiting. And, and similar to what Charlotte and Candy were saying, it's it's very surprising sometimes the the self limitations within the queer community, or at least in, in my experience, um, given that these are folks who understand what it means to be other. These are folks who understand what it means to be non-normative, to be um, something that might not even exist in, in actuality um, and to be the first and to, to you know, put yourself out there in a way um, that may be intimidating or that people might not initially understand. So yeah, it's been, it's been quite interesting. And it's, like I said, it's, it's everyday sort of journey. And some days I feel like I'm, I'm getting it and some days I, I struggle with it. But um, yeah, I, I feel really lucky to also have far more like non-binary people in my life so that I, I have those examples and those folks that I can like chat with and, and vent with and, you know, parse through, parse through my own identity. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been really good, but it's definitely been a challenge to unlearn those things. Can I share a favorite quote with you? Uh, I'm, yeah. a metal head. I'm a metalhead from way back. And uh, my first tattoo ever was a Motley Crue tattoo. And when Molly <laughs> Crew hit the scene wearing makeup, it people couldn't understand. Are you gay? Are you straight? What's it? And Nikki Six in an interview said this, and I I have it on a T-shirt. I say it all the time, and it's this: just because I'm wearing lipstick doesn't mean I can't kick your ass. <laughs> and I think that is a perfect quote. Beautiful, and like you've spoken so beautifully about it, and I was thinking as well with your fashion. Um, because you, know, you have this beautiful fashion page and you have these beautiful, these amazing outfits. Just, and like I said, it's kind mm -hmm. of like, well, it depends. Like today I've got these shoulder pads and I'm like, yeah, um, sort of thing. Um, yeah, like, do you feel like that kind of sort of, I mean, it, it, will, it will all feeds into it, but how do you think the way you do your fashion sort of feeds into your sort of gender identity? You can sort of talk about that. It's definitely... Um a huge source of expression. I mean, fashion is like 
my primary creative expression. And um, as I started my queer journey, I started off actually also being extremely femme, like traditionally femme. Um, and over time, I kind of examined that and, and realized that there were parts of it that I really loved, but a lot of it was uh, me imposing ideals of what my body should be or the way that I should adorn myself. And I think um, I, I love using clothes as a tool to show people that your body is not a limitation for the way that you can express your style. And I do find a lot of folks um, will mention to me and be like, oh my gosh, I never thought like someone who looked like me could wear this or like I'm short. So oftentimes that comes up, like people will be like, oh, I, I could never wear that. I'm too short. And I'm like, I am short. Like you are looking at me telling me that you couldn't do it. And I'm probably shorter than you. So what is actually happening is, is you sort of stopping yourself before you even get out of the gate. Um, and I think for me, clothing is a really uh, fun and uh, expansive way to kind of explore the different sides of, of who I feel I am and, and who I want to be in the world. And I mean, I'm also a person who wears like tons of color. And I think that color is weirdly something that is associated with a specifically feminine identity and I don't really mm. understand why that is um or or not I don't understand but I'm frustrated by that limitation um and I think that that is also like something that I enjoy exploring and, and something that I enjoy challenging is just because you think x is y doesn't mean that's what is the only thing that exists um and and I I definitely um, there's many people who like inspire me in that way as well. Um, but yeah, I think just like un slowly un unraveling all of these assumptions of like what my body can be, what I can adorn myself with, who I can be moving through the world. Like that's so exciting to me. And it's really exciting to me, uh, to see other folks feel empowered to do the same thing, because I think that everybody should be able to express themselves in their clothing the way that they want. And we're not at that point, we're very far away from that point, but um, it's important to me to, to keep pushing back and to keep proving people wrong that there are fat folks who want to wear baggy clothing. There are non-binary folks who don't just wear gray. There's, you know, there's, there's so much more than, um, what has been presented to us and just because it's been presented to us doesn't mean we need to accept it I think yes I have to say one of the things that I found so heartbreaking about Lydia's interview is that Lydia would would often use the word aloud and I found <laughs> that to be it's a really kind of a heartbreaking word to hear to hear someone lean on through the to describe their thought process and their activism and their coming out and Lydia I mean I've watched all of your interviews a hundred times so I could practically <laughs> recite to you the things that you've said but Lydia would often say I have a body I'm allowed to go to the pool I'm allowed to wear a bathing suit and you could sort of see them unpacking some of this logic and kind of making their initial forays into like going to the pool, wearing a bathing suit in public, you know, and then as a model and as a person, a style influencer, would I say, um, <laughs> being like, I could, I could even post those pictures on the internet, I'm allowed. And I find it like poetic and heartbreaking that, that Lydia would, would come back to that word so often. And I, um, I think about it myself oftentimes too, when I'm screwing up the courage to do something in my everyday life. And, um, yeah, it's really stuck with me. So it's, it kind of goes back to this. It's just every part of our society, we're still just fighting for this sense of pluralism. That That's how I break it down. It's like within all of this power and control, all we're saying is just fuck off. Like there's a great variety of individuals yeah. out there. Things that don't deviate from the norm are not wrong. Like embrace pluralism. Your life will become so much more interesting and people will live without all of this baggage. But um yeah, nod, nod to you both. You yeah, it's, it's sort of like unlearning these sort of rules and realising that you can actually break these, you know, you can sort of step on them and realise that 
is not an actual science. It's not like a mathematical equation. It's not a wrong or right. It's actually is a way. There's always something you can actually break through and realize that actually this kind of was like made up. You know, so much about gender is made up, um, and so much about sexuality is, it can be sort of just made up and and fatness. You know what I mean? Like the stripes. You know what I mean? Don't wear stripes from even not that long ago. There's sort of all these weird things or um, to flatter your body um, sort of thing. Um, so you don't see everything you wear must make you look sort of smaller. Always find quite interesting. Um, noticing time's running on. So I wanted to sort of, um, I mentioned in my notes about sort of authentic fat representation. And I, I wanted to make sure the word authentic was sort of put in there because I think sometimes you say, oh, you see more of us and it's great. And it's, and it's never really that, is it? It's sort of, um, there's an actual thing you need to have that actually connects um, that lived experience into something that sort of makes sense that actually feels like um, that yeah that that is not sort of ticking a box or sort of sneaky sort of playing on our emotions so I was gonna start with um, Shana because I do feel like um, you really managed to sort of put that all together and bring that out so like you know how did you yeah like you know how did you sort of choose sort of people like Candy and Lydia to sort of be in your film and what was that authentic fat representation that you were sort of facing for that you succeeded in with well with, with, with well rounded? Yeah, I think it goes back to um, I sort of synthesized it as uh, who, who's fat in public. So I thought that would be an interesting way to to filter because otherwise you could just interview lots of people who are um, in the scene. But I, I thought it was interesting to to go to a comedian, to a model. Um, Ivory, who's not here today, who's a dancer, Joanne, who's another comedian. Um, I also thought it was really important to um, to talk to people whose experiences, you know, slightly contradict one another. And it's not an argument; it's a it's a dialogue. So, you know, for some of us, being fat in our families um, was a terrible hardship and a terrible place of disconnection. Um, and and uh, Joanne in particular, who's in the film, had the sense of really disappointing her family, um, but talking about the great love that was there. Um, Candy totally celebrated and beloved in her family. Um, and then Lydia felt this sense of like, why don't they understand how hard it is for me? And that was, you know, so it's, I, you know, and I had come from it selfishly trying to find out if my, if, if I could test my theory that, um, you know, maybe some of us had um, had the same dissonance where in our families we were accepted, but it was only outside our families that we that we weren't. Um, but part of what I found um, very satisfying in realizing the film was using the animation. And I want to give credit to Alexandra Honer, who actually lives in Brighton, I believe. Oh. And we and we did all of this remotely. Um, so she's over in the UK and she'll be watching. Um, and we had such excellent discussions about representation and how to kind of render some of these emotions through the animation and do some things that we didn't have the budget or the time or maybe the skill, I'll say for myself, uh, to, to do live action. Um, and then also the music. So we were able to lean on um, Kim Mortal, who's this killer non-binary Filipinx uh, hip hop artist uh, who lives here on the west coast of Canada, who has that anthemic song like Welcome to the Sad Femme Club, Baby, You Are Enough. Mm -hmm. And to me, just the repetition of that song has just been kind of life changing to me. And um, yeah. Please. Yeah, first <laughs> I want to just acknowledge the animation point. Uh, as soon as I heard animation, I was like, no, because every time I've ever been animated, they, they, they make my feet and my legs really, really tiny, and they make me look like a cartoon bulldog. Now, I am a big woman, not just fat. I am five foot ten with a 34 inch inseam and a size 11 foot. So I don't want short little tiny legs. I have long legs that can do some damage, and I want them to look like that. So I get really whenever I see that I'm going to be animated. And I also get a little frustrated with this whole plus size thing that's happening now. Um, but but I'm, I'm also really cognizant of how society has done this. And, and I want to share a little something with you. I was flipping through a magazine about, I guess it was probably maybe nine, 10 years ago. And 
I came to a picture of a woman and my first thought was, that's the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. My second thought was, she's a big girl because she looked really big compared to what I had been looking at in the magazine. So I, I read, you know, who is this? I'm reading, yeah, it's a plus size model, blah, blah, blah. And she's talking about her life and how she tried to be a straight size model and then she got really sick and da, da, da. So now I come to comfort being a plus size model at five foot 10, 150 pounds. And I'm like, five foot 10, 150 pounds? That is not plus size. I, I'm not even at my training weight at that point. Like when I was athletic, you know, when I got full muscle on, I'm, I'm up around 170. And then I thought, but Candy, you looked at her and said, she's a big girl when she really isn't. It's just that they show me so many girls and women that look like 12 year old boys and, and hey, it's your body and embrace it. But it's not the only body and it's not the average body either. So when I see that someone's being embraced as a plus size model and she's talking about fat positivity and all this, and, and I know it's not a competition, but I'm thinking lady, you do not know what it is to not be able to get a pap smear because you can't fit on that table. You do not know what it is to be on a dash eight on a way to a big gig about to interview somebody really fantastic and you try to use the washroom and you realize you cannot get through the door on a dash eight airplanes bathroom. And I had that experience in front of a full plane full of people. So I get really frustrated at who gets to talk about being fat. And also you have to be pretty in order to be accepted as fat because God help you if you're fat and ugly. Because as a woman, listen, if you're not pretty, you might as well throw yourself under the next train, which drives me nuts when people talk about, oh, beauty at any age. And I say, no, to hell with beauty. Beauty is like dessert. Enjoy it if you've got it, but understand that it has zero nutritional value. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our brothers, they don't, they don't spend a lot of time and money on worrying about being beautiful. That's why they're getting paid 25% more than us. And they're getting all the jobs as CEOs because we're wasting all our time and money worried about being beautiful. And beauty doesn't count one bit. You know what's beautiful? When I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror and I say to myself, I can do hard things. That is something worth doing. Who cares about beauty? Yeah. I think also, you know, when you get people be like, I'm fat, but I'm really fit. I do all this gym three times a day sort of thing. And it's just like, actually doesn't matter to me doesn't matter to me yes, exactly. yeah yeah and people like spend uh, more time working out their soul than they do working out on the size of their butt the world would be a different place and grace i was going to come to you because you know you've done your really great sort of program of shorts of sort of around fat bodies and stuff so i guess so you know you've done lots of research and sort of trying to find those sort of right kinds of films so i was going to ask you about that sort of authentic queer fat representation mm, yeah I feel like I have now entered maybe every single combination of words on google to try and find fat films um every single one uh, varied results it took a while but this was the thing like with um my program of films so I think it was about seven short films that I programmed um every single time I like sort of did an interview about it people were like wow and you found these films and there's like there's seven of them and you found all of these and you've you've done it and I'm like uh. they, they do exist they are out there and this is kind of what I've been trying to do um with the Instagram page as well it's just looking back through history and I think our, it always comes back to archive and it's rem uh, remembering it's like you were saying earlier Charlotte in terms of um the pe first people that started writing about fatness people have always been kind of having these conversations and people have been living authentically it's just that these conversations weren't necessarily happening then or you know they maybe weren't happening with the addition of social media but yeah there's 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 been you know fat people making films uh fat people starring in films films about fatness for ages it's just the ones that are sort of coming to the surface are the same, it's the same stories over and over again. And you do have to sort of dig a little bit deeper to find authentic ones and especially to find um, intersectionality and, you know, films about fatness and queerness, fatness and disability, fatness and race, things like that. But I, yeah, I feel this for so many sort of marginalized identities, but I don't want people to be like, oh, there are no films about fat people out there. Cause it's just, it's absolutely not true. Yeah, and like, you know, there's always this idea that 
this thing, you know, oh, when we started talking about fat bodies a few years ago, when actually, in all the sense of the word, whether you're, you know, and all your identities, they've always been there, we've always existed, and sometimes it's sort of looking between the lines to sort of see, like, who's actually there looking back at you, you know, right there, sort of thing. Um, I know I mentioned in the email as well about sort of, um, I guess, sort of, yeah, recommendations or sort of people who may have sort of inspired you or people who made you sort of feel differently about sort of the intersectionality of our bodies, for your fatness, your queerness and such. Um, in a sense, just to sort of give people something to hang on to. I think I'm kind of conscious that there'll be parts of this audience who will be right at the start of their sort of un unlearning about the sort of harmful stereotypes and so-called rules of being sort of fat and queer. So just something for them to sort of get started to maybe like a bit of homework, if you will. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, start with a very general uh, recommendation, which is just go to Instagram and just change your feed. So that's what I did kind of at the beginning of this process. I suck at social media. I'm rarely on social media because it makes me depressed. But then uh, Instagram actually became my favorite place to kind of secretly scroll because it wasn't about my, it wasn't insular. It didn't feel like, oh, I'm looking at that former work colleague or I'm looking at this person that I know. It was all kind of these proud fat BIPOC people because I chose my feed selectively. So I follow people like Candy and Lydia and Ivory who's in the film. And then I follow a lot of the Black Lives Matter uh, leaders, the land back folks, um, Latinx uh, body positive folks. So just kind of generally. So it's less about celebrity. It's less about people that I know. And I find it to be, you know, I kind of click on Instagram for a few minutes. I scroll for maybe like four or five swipes and then I feel kind of done. And uh, that's, that's what I would recommend to people more than um, any particular celebrities that, that come to mind. But I found it to be quite transformative. I love that because I think when people do think of Instagram and kind of like, oh, but actually, you know, you can sort of curate your feed and sort of decide what you see. You know, I do sort of, because I do think if you did sort of just follow, if you didn't really, if you weren't conscious about who you were following, you can end up getting a very warped sense again of sort of what bodies sort of look like. Like a really basic thing for me was um online clothes shop and in their plus size, fat sizes, I would say fat sizes, in their fat sizes section, they actually have slightly fat models <laughs> um but like uh, what, but, but i didn't realize how much was the impact until i say i started looking at the maternity clothes because i got a big belly so i want big belly clothes and then i saw suddenly see these really slim people and i'm like whoa even just seeing like size 14 people wearing actual clothes it's like enough to sort of just readjust your mind so you yeah, know that's a really fantastic um place to start um, I will next pick on Charlotte. Well, I've got so, so many, so many places that I go to feel uh, nourished and uh, represented. But I suppose, you know, I come from punk and there's a saying in punk, which, which is about don't hate the media, become the media. And, I, and another quote as well from June Jordan, who's the most mm. excellent uh, poet and writer about, well, uh, we're the ones that we've been waiting for. I really feel that so strongly that, you know, in terms of making authentic uh, representation and, and stuff that moves us, we have to do it ourselves. We can't, you know, we can't allow other people to, to do it. We, we, we have to in include ourselves in, in that stuff. So I think the making is, is really important. But in terms of stuff that exists out there, you know, My Happy Place is the archive, um, the Fat Underground film from 19, uh, 1982, maybe, or 72, I can't remember. No, 82 is when they got the film together, I think. is on YouTube. You know, it's, it's so old. Uh, you know, they used one of those video cameras that you had to have a giant kind of bag thing, like Andy Warhol, they made this video. I just think it's absolutely extraordinary. Other characters I love, I mean, that's a, a documentary that was made by activists, but a, a filmic representation I love, well, I love uh, La Saragina in Fellini's Eight and a Half. She's a sex worker. She does this incredible dance. She's got these shifty eyes. You know, she's absolutely amazing. Uh, I also love Darlene Cates. What's Eating Gilbert Great is a pretty uh, problematic film, but her, um, her performance in it as a super fat, 
um, Infinifa actor is mind boggling and brilliant. And, you know, why don't we see more really, really fat people on screen um, owning it? Um, and I also really love the films of uh, Percy Adlon in the 80s. Um, he uh, um, worked with an actor called Marianne uh, Zuckerbrecht, who's a German woman and or Austrian, not sure. Anyway, and uh, those films, I think, really um, exemplified a kind of uh, queer, fat uh, sensibility. So th those are probably my, my favourite ones. I mean, all the usual ones as well, like, you know, Divine and... Um, yeah, any kind of like fat bad girl on film, then then I'm there. But I think La Saragina probably is is one of my favourite filmic representations of, of fatness, and that's what I would encourage people to go and look at because she's amazing. Uh, first of all, I just have to say after this uh, this conversation, Dr. Charlotte, I'm going to look for your books, and we have to have an agreement. If you come to Toronto, I'm going to buy you a bottle of wine. We're going to share some mousse poutine. Oh. If I come to you, what about a pint and some curry? Whatever your thing is. I'm totally up for it. Totally up for it. I love you. <laughs> we definitely have to have a chat. And you said you came from punk. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, we're cosmically related somehow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm your indigenous cousin from Canada. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think throughout my life, I have really looked at, I've had a hard time to find, like, I, I can't right now name for you a fat, queer, indigenous person except for me so that that's in the public eye yeah, but yeah. I look for I look for little things to inspire me here there and everywhere and in Canada there was a, an actor who became very big in the United States he started as a comedian a guy named John Candy John Candy was massive a big fat man and John Candy played the romantic lead in hit movies like the romantic lead and even though he's a man in movies, you see it in sitcoms, but in movies, you very rarely see a big fat man playing a romantic lead. So he was always an inspiration to me. I can tell you the moment, like for Americans, when JFK died, I was sitting on my couch. I was living in Halifax at the time when I watched Beauty Shop for the first time and Queen Latifah had a makeout scene with a buff fit guy. And I, 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 I stop and I'm jumping around the living room and my friends are like, what? I'm like, you don't understand. Fat women do not get to kiss the hunk in movies. It doesn't happen. And it was so amazing. And it wasn't some like, oh, you know, do something for, for the fat girl. It was like that movie started with her saying to her daughter, does my ass look fat in this jeans? And her daughter goes, yeah. And she goes, excellent. And walks out the door. <laughs> So like that is, and, and then on, on my social media, I watch TikTok a lot. And what I love about TikTok, the more you watch certain things and like them, the more of those things come into your feed. And I, you know, there's a, and there's a couple of women on Instagram that I, I'll, I'll email you after so you can put it in the discussion because I can't think of them off the top of my head. One of them is a woman who in her pictures looks like she's one of those young fit models but then she will show you, okay, so this is the picture that most people put on Instagram. Now here's the real me in the normal lighting. And she's got all these massive stretch marks and all this incredibly loose skin all over her legs and her butt. And she will show you like within seconds of one another, how this is what I actually look like. But when I lean this way and I put the light right there and I make sure the camera's right here and I do this, this is what I look like. So don't try to look like those people because you cannot look like them. And there is one more that I want to talk about is a woman on Instagram who I remember her, her product name, but I can't remember her handle right now. She started doing, she would take famous pictures of celebrities and then she replicates the outfit and she puts them side by side and she looks fabulous. Then she came out with a line of products called Mega Babe. And it's all the things that we Mega Babes need. There's dust bust powder that you can put here Ooh. so that you smell fresh. There's down there wipes for front or back so you can freshen up when it's sweaty in the summer. There's chub rub stick, which is she'll stop in New York, put her foot up on a hydrant in a dress and rub this thing on her inner thighs so that you don't get the chub rub when you walk. I'm into and it. She, and she goes into stores and she shames designers because she'll say, this is an extra large. Here's me trying to put it on. And she'll show a picture of her like with her boobs stuck out and everything. She can't get it on. She did that to Diane von Thurstenberg and they and Diane made a wrap dress to fit her and had her come. And now Diane is doing wrap dresses in a full array of sizes. 
that is using your platform to change the world. And I'll, I'm, I'm so sad. I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but I'll send it to you so you can put it in the feed. So Mega Babe. I know her. Brand. <laughs> Mega Babe, you know her? Yeah, her name is Katie Serino. There it is. Yes. And her account, I think, is the, it might be her name now. It used to be the 12-ish style, but yeah, she's, she's super rad. She's so funny. And she's like, yeah, just really, awesome. she's a really great person to follow. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> and why did it take so long for somebody to come up with down there wipes and dust bust for the love of God? Right. And I like actually use her like uh, chub rub stick and it is excellent. It keeps oh. my legs from not burning each other during the summer. Um, so yeah. I can I can speak to the brand itself. It's definitely um, legit. It's not just a marketing gimmick, which is awesome. Great. Yeah, I need something for my boobs for the summer. You know, just all every day I gotta do the stick um for the booze and just sort of yeah, fix it up. Okay. Um great. So obviously you got your fat and film. So you got you put up sort of inspirations, not inspiration, I hate the word actually inspiration. Just awesome people thinking points every day. Um, what, it. Oh, yeah. My favorite thing is when they're not inspirations, to be honest. I love a yes. good yeah. fat villain, but not like a villain that's fat because they're lazy like someone that's just yeah. evil and happens to be fat and actually candy um just going back to a point of john candy it is incredible my favorite thing is if i post a picture of john candy john goodman philip seymour hoffman i think they're kind of like the top three the amount of thirst on those pictures is absolutely <laughs> incredible and it's just like been my absolute favorite thing because fat people are hot and fat actors and actors are hot and we should be saying this and we should be <laughs> sexualizing them more so. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> I absolutely love that um in terms of my recommendations um whenever I'm sort of feeling down I will listen to Missy Elliott or watch a Missy Elliott music video especially from like back in the day like her Hype Williams directed videos especially the one for the rain where she's in that like inflatable oh yeah yes. that is just incredible to me and it makes me laugh so much that people are like oh all these rappers nowadays like cardi b and megan the stallion they're so sexual it's so disgusting and it's like have you listened to what missy ellie was saying <laughs> the day? It, it's absolutely filthy but because she was a bit you know mm. she's still obviously a bit large now but she was significantly fatter back in the day people just weren't taking the lyrics seriously so yeah. she is my constant inspiration and then also I just really recommend um the fat zine that um, my friends Gina Tonic and Chloe Shepherd run and also polyester that's run by my friend Ione Gamble there's a lot of cool and um, sort of zines and media about fatness happening in the UK at the moment that I love awesome and then um, Lydia was there anyone on top of um each repeat mega babes name again that you would sort of that you want to sort of have out there yeah so uh the person who makes mega babe her name is katie storino um and like candy said she does like it's not a who wore it better but just like uh yeah, like make it, it size fat like so she wears the same outfits i i definitely really love that feature and it's so fun to see uh her like copy the photos exactly. Um, my recommendation, I mean, there's, there's so many people, but one that came to mind in regards to film and representation uh, is a writer and film critic named Zeba Blay, um, Z-E-B-A-B-L-A-Y. She uh, is a, um, a, a, yeah, a film critic and also a writer and her Instagram specifically, she curates um, just archival footage of various Black people specifically. Um, and so I find that when I'm looking or just needing to be reminded that, that Black folks and Black fat folks and Black queer folks, which all of those folks you'll find on her page, have existed and have been expressing themselves and creating and envisioning a future that we haven't quite reached. Um, for themselves, I find her page is, is just a great place to go. And it's, if you just like visual culture, like, and don't want to read, but just literally want that, you know, that hit of, of beautiful imagery, I think she does such an excellent job always. Um, and I like just sit and swipe and like, 
look at all the beautiful imagery she posts. So that would be somebody I would definitely recommend if you're looking for like film representation. She has such a expansive knowledge of specifically like African film. Um, so she's a really good reference point. And, and I see so many people who look like me and, and the people that I know um, in, in her, her kind of roundup. So that's, if you're looking for just like Instagram page to follow, yeah. Ziva Blay is, is really, really rad. Awesome. Well, there you go. That's is the irrefutable truth. Facts, queer people are everywhere, squeezing through the bus doors, taking up a few seats on the plane, asking for an extender, eating donuts in the supermarket. We've not paid yet. You know, getting our, pulling our dresses up and sort of just having to rub our thighs a little bit, getting wet at the swimming pool. Can't escape it. So just don't be a dick. Um, <laughs> um, we are pretty out of time. So unless anyone got anything really burning to say. Tara, I want to thank you for being our programmer. Thanks for being the, the infiltrator, bringing us into the venerated BFI. I see you and appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> come to London all of you come to London um I really I just want to watch Candy and Charlotte wreak havoc in Toronto or London <laughs> I can do either, either city you just know that the day after shit has gone down I I will I really want to see that um so yes um so much thank you for being so involved in this talk and really sort of just like putting yourselves out there thank you so much so um thank you Grace Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Candy. Massive thank you to you, Shana, for getting this rolling. Um, I really, I'm sure people are going to love this film. Um, I'm, I'm bigging it up all the time. And um, yeah, so yes, there you go. That was the extended discussion for Well Rounded for BFI Flare and 2021. Um, I'm sure there's lots of other films you want to watch. Remember that all the short packages are free. And please talk about Well Rounded on social media to spread the word to make sure that everyone is aware that this has arrived. And um, thank you all so much. <laughs> thank, thank you. Sarah. You're all awesome. Thank you.